Well, I mean, essentially, you have to understand what causes unemployment before you find a solution. And uh, basic macroeconomics, on which uh, modern monetary theory is built, establishes very clearly that uh, employment is generated by spending. As firms respond to spending, uh, they make sales and therefore they put on product, they, they create output and they put on workers. And so if uh, there are people who can't find jobs, there, it means there's not enough spending. And then you have to investigate what are the, what's, what are, what's the source of that deficient spending. And you can usually say that uh, the non-government sector, which is the sum of the households, the firms and the external sector, if they desire to save a portion of their income, and that income's not recycled back into sales and production, then unless the, that spending gap is uh, filled by the government sector, then there'll be unemployment. And, uh, and I'm talking about mass unemployment. There'll always be some unemployment because people are moving in between jobs. But the mass unemployment is due to deficient spending. And what that prescribes then is that the government sector has to be able to fill the spending gap left by non-government sector saving. And that's what we, that's, it does that by running deficits. And if there's mass unemployment, then we know that the deficits are too small. So that's the first general observation. So we need more spending. Now what modern monetary theory also says is that we should uh, uh, eliminate unemployment altogether other than the people moving between jobs, the so-called frictional unemployment. And the most basic intervention would be to create an employment guarantee. So instead of people going into unemployment when spending fluctuates, they would go into a guaranteed government job. But more up, but on top of that, the government has to ensure, in my view, that there is this sufficient spending and, and they can do that by creating, you know, professional and career jobs beyond the job guarantee. Well, that's the problem. And uh, uh, for, for a, a country like my own, Australia, or the US or Japan or the United Kingdom, there's no question about whether they can afford it uh, because uh, uh, these governments issue their own currencies and they can spend as much as they want. They can buy whatever is available for sale in that currency without question. Now that's not the same thing as they should go crazy with their spending. They should spend so that everybody has a job that wants one. So for, a country, for countries outside the Eurozone who issue their own currency, there's no question that they can afford it. What, what, what limits government spending in those economies is the real resources available to be bought. So, and labor, idle labor is one real resource that can be bought. But for a Eurozone country, one of the, one of the uh, problems of the structure of the Eurozone is that when Spain entered the Eurozone, it surrendered its own currency. And by surrendering its own currency, you adopted to use a foreign currency. The Euro is a foreign currency to all 19 members. And the, what that means then is that uh, unlike the United States or Australia who can m make spending whenever it likes, a Eurozone country has to be able to fund its own spending and it has to either be able to spend its tax revenue or if it hasn't got sufficient tax revenue to cover its spending, it has to then borrow in the bond markets. And they're the only two options for a country that doesn't have its own currency. And so the question is, how can it afford it? Well, it can only afford it if the bond markets are willing to fund deficits beyond the tax revenue raised. And you've got an additional problem then in the Eurozone. So go back to that point. The, bond, the problem with Eurozone countries with respect to the bond markets is that 
unlike Australia and the US and Japan and UK, Canada, all these countries, who have no credit risk attached to government spending and government borrowing, a Eurozone country can go broke. And so therefore it has credit risk and therefore the bond markets will see that country in a very different way. It will evaluate that country in a very different way that it will evaluate the United States, for example, or Japan, because they, the bond markets know that those, Japan and the United States, etc., will never really, will never default on its liabilities. It can always afford to pay them. Whereas a country like Spain, the bond markets know that under some circumstances, your, your government can get into trouble and be forced to default on its debt. For example, what we're seeing in Greece this week is more turmoil because of this credit risk. And so the ability to spend in a Eurozone country is limited by how much you can borrow. And on top of that, then, is the rules constraining, even if the bond markets are willing to lend your government's money, you still can't have deficits that might be large enough to satisfy the spend, fill the spending gap because of the stability and growth pack rules. And so when you ask me how can the Spanish government afford such a scheme, well, I would say that it's highly, problem, highly likely that it can't afford such a scheme because you don't have your own currency. Well, this is the problem that uh, you've got two problems in the Eurozone. One, the first problem began when you surrendered your own currencies. That's problem number one. So then you, then you rely on bond, bond markets. The bond markets are going to take into account what they believe is the risk of them getting their money back. And uh, as I said, for the bond markets will consider Spain to be much more risky than Australia because there's zero risk in Australia. They know they'll get their money back. You know, Donald Trump said on TV a couple of days ago, he said, this is, let me tell you something, this is America. We never default on our debt because we print our own currency. The Spanish government can never say that. And, uh, and so the problem, that's the, that's the first problem. And then the second problem, that even within the limits of the ability to borrow from bond markets, Brussels has got fiscal rules in place. And so it may be that if you have a, and we saw it in 2009, that if you have a sufficiently deep downturn in private spending, then the fiscal deficit will rise on its own accord because tax revenue collapses and it breaches those limits, the 3% limit, then the Spanish government's got no flexibility at all. And it may be that the flexibility that you've got within that 3% range might be sufficient in most circumstances. But if you have a deep recession, the evidence from 2009, 2010 is that that 3% isn't sufficient. It's too narrow a, a band, not enough flexibility. Most Eurozone countries sh should have run deficits much higher than that, which they did, and they should have left them there for a long time. So the, the answer to your question is that the Eurozone country is really tightly constrained by these rules and the lack of currency and can't respond to a deep crisis without the support of the European Central Bank, which is largely banned by the Treaty of Lisbon to responding in an appropriate way. Well, one of the principles of modern monetary theory is that the a particular value of a, a, a fiscal balance, a deficit or a surplus, is a meaningless thing without a context. And it's the context that's, not, that's important, not the actual figure. And so this, this idea that has emerged in the neoliberal era that the actual value of the fiscal balance is something that's all important and, and can be considered in isolation of a context is 
leading to very poor economic decisions being made. There should never be a, 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 a number set to a target that a government should achieve because ultimately what we know is that the non-government sector determines the outcome for the government rather than the government. And what I mean by that is that if the non-government sector wants to save a lot of its income, then the deficit has to rise or else the economy goes into recession. And if the economy goes into recession, and if the, if the non-government sector spending falls and it starts to save more, and the government doesn't immediately respond, then sales fall, inventories in firms rise, firms notice the unsold goods in their warehouses and whatever, their shops, and they start to cut back output because they say there's not enough spending and they start to lay off workers. And that laying off workers, they lose their income and then that re reverberates in second and third and fourth round effects, the spending multiplier. And so if, if, if that happens and the government doesn't respond, well then the government deficit will go up anyway because the lack of employment will reduce taxation revenue and in most countries the welfare payments will rise and so the deficit increases anyway and, and that, that, that process is called the automatic stabilisers and so in that sense it's really the non-government sector spending and saving decisions that drive the overall balance that the government has, not, not what the government wants to do. That's the first point. The, the second point is that it makes no sense for the government to think of the fiscal balance in isolation. The purpose of fiscal policy isn't to generate a surplus or a balance or a deficit of 1% of GDP. That's, that's thinking in isolation. The purpose of fiscal policy is that, that is government spending and taxation. The purpose of that is to ensure there's enough spending in the economy to create full employment and prosperity and allow the non-government sector saving desires to be realised. That's the purpose of fiscal policy. So when you're evaluating the state of the fiscal situation, you're not looking at the number, you're looking at how many people are employed and, and how prosperous the economy is. And, and you might have a situation where a deficit of 1% of GDP is appropriate, but another situation when a deficit of 5% of GDP is appropriate. And then again, in some situations, a surplus of 1% of GDP might be appropriate. And what, what, how we determine which of those three options is appropriate depends upon what the non-government sector is doing. So for Norway, for example, the non-government sector savings are strong overall. Its government has small surpluses. Why? because its export sector is so strong. But for most countries that don't have booming export sectors, to be able to allow the domestic non-government sector to save, the government has to run a deficit. That's, that's the fact. And so when we're looking at what's been going on in the Eurozone, you asked me about austerity. Well. All of the economics books I've ever read tell, tell us that if non-government sector spending is falling and there's rising unemployment, then the solution for the government has to be to increase its net spending, its deficit, has to. That's what economic theory tells us. But, and these statements from Brussels and IMF that we've got to have austerity to re restore growth are not economic statements, they're ideological statements. They have no foundation in economics. Cutting government spending at a time when non-government sector spending is falling is the height of irresponsibility. And you know that that's just ideological statements, that they want to limit government, size of government, and force governments to privatise and to cut back on pensions and government employment. So the, 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 the fact is that it's, it's not just modern monetary theory that says this, all economic theory really says 
that you should never run pro-cyclical fiscal policy. You always should use fiscal policy to offset non-government sector spending dynamics, not to reinforce them in one direction or the other. 